So our next speaker will be Peter, originally from Germany, then from uh, New York, and now to sort of the world capital land. <laughs> Thank you. So <clears throat> good morning, just about. Um, so this, <clears throat> this year's joint work with, uh, with Mulligan, who is uh, sitting over there, um, and will speak on Wednesday. So um, um, this is related to, uh, to some of the previous talks, to uh, Baswa's talk yesterday, to the talk we just heard. Um, but I would like to convince you that if we step back a little bit from the graph limit formalism and look at things from a certain perspective, then in some sense, um, something very interesting is going on. So if we start from the same idea as the talk just now, and that we want to estimate something, then um, <clears throat> suppose we have some random structure. And for now, I just assume this is a sequence. I have an infinite sequence. But x in my talk here is always some random structure. And think of it as infinitely large. Infinite sequence, infinite graph, whatever. Yeah. So. Now I have, um, in the case where this is a sequence, and I think of this as observed data, right? So this is data that is coming in. I see the first n values of it. I would like to estimate some function of it, so the expectation, right? So the kind of the fundamental, I would argue, the fundamental theorems of estimation are the law of large numbers and the center limit theorem. Right? So the law of large numbers tells me if I take the sample average or the first n values of the sequence is iid, then that converges to something meaningful. Namely, I have a consistent estimator of my of the expected value of this function here. So it de-randomizes at the limit. I can estimate the property of the underlying distribution from data. And then the central limit theorem tells me how quickly does that happen. I mean, I need conditions here, of course, right? I need moments, but morally, this is what happens. So and the setup that I'm um, I want to tell you about today is um, distributional symmetry. And what I mean by that is that my infinitely large structure here is invariant under some group of transformations that act on it. So I have some transformation phi, I apply it to my structure x, and that changes the structure, but it does not change its distribution. So and that has to hold for all elements of some group G. So and basically, in short, um, the short summary of my talk is that if we have suitable conditions on this group here and on the way that X and that group interact, then first of all, the group tells us how to compute a sample average. Because if this is a graph or some other structure, then I mean, what is, I may have not, I may not have an analog of just taking the first n elements, right? I may not know what that means. So the group tells us how to compute an average. So, and versions of these results still hold. So those averages that I compute that way are consistent estimators of an expectation in a certain sense, and I get a central limit theorem and even higher order results. Okay. So, and um, this is um, uh, this is a mutilated picture. There is a there is gray here, but uh, you can't it's see it. It's oh yeah, it's with oh yeah, right. Thank you. So, but. What we need is the dots, okay? So um, let me just give you a toy example of how this average works in a case where, um, um, where the group is so simple that it's not actually interesting, but I can plot it, okay? So here is a red dot. Think of that as a point in the plane, okay? And I'm gonna rotate that dot here around the black dot. That is my center of rotation. So the group I'm looking at are rotations around the black dot, the rotations of the plane around the black dot. So and now I take a subset of that group, which is just the angles from zero to some number. Okay, and I've graphed that here as this black arc. Yeah, the little black arc that is the trace of my red dot if I rotate by this segment here. So, and now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this integral here. So I'm gonna take this here is a uniform distribution. UN is a uniform distribution on the set AM, right? So the uniform distribution on this arc. <clears throat> and I'm going to integrate against that if I, the, the value of the red dot, if I move it along this line. So the outcome is again going to be a point in the plane. 
right? But it is now no longer on the arc because it's basically the, the center of mass of this arc. So it's moved inward a little bit, okay? So now I make the set larger and larger. I take larger and larger subsets of the group of rotations. And I can see that as I go along, the point moves closer and closer to the origin. And then finally, when I integrate over the entire group, it ends up in the origin, right? So far, so trivial. So the two observations that I want to make about that is the first one is that when I integrate over the entire group, the point I get out in the end is invariant under the group, right? The center of origin is exactly the one point in the plane that is invariant under rotations. I rotate it, nothing happens, right? So, and secondly, if I put a uniform distribution on this black circle here, so on the, the rim, not on the disk, but on the rim of the circle, then this, this um, center point here that I get out that way is also exactly the expected value of that, right? So there is another way that I can uh, characterize the uniform distribution on the circle, namely it's exactly the one distribution on the circle that is invariant under rotations. So if I put all of that together, what I have here is that at least in this case, if the distribution of X is invariant under the group and I average over the group, I take a point, a fixed point and average it over the group, then I compute the expectation of the distribution. Okay. So I can compute an expectation by a group average. And that is what I would like to do. But in this case, I can actually average over the group and put a uniform distribution on it because it's compact. So in general, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a group and I assume that it has Haar measure. Yeah, some group on which I can like have something like a measure, like the back measure that I can um, restrict to a uniform distribution on compact sets. So then that X is a G, and, G invariant random element of some space on which this group acts. And I take compact subsets, A1, A2, and so on are compact subsets of this group. And the importance of compactness is if I, on, on a compact set, I can normalize how measure to a probability measure. Yeah, I have a uniform distribution. So, and then F is always a measurable function on my space here. So that take, can take X as an argument and puts out a real value. And what I want to do is I want to estimate the expectation of F, F of X. So the quantity I'm gonna look at is an average like this, an integral like this. I take one of these sets, I take the uniform distribution on that set in the group, and I compute an average like this. So, and that is of course, simply because it's a uniform distribution that is simply this integral here. So, and if the group is countable, then Haar measure is always counting measure, or I always choose a counting measure. And then what I get is simply this normalized sum. Yeah. And a simple example is um, if I take, if I go back to the sequence case, right, that I had on my first slide, and I said, so I, X is an infinite sequence, I said F as a first coordinate function that just extracts the first element, and A n as the permutations of the numbers one through n, then this here is, I'm permuting, I'm, I'm basically, so I'm, this here picks out the first entry of this permuted sequence, right, and then what I get by cancellation here, these are n factorial numbers, but what I get by cancellation is simply the sample average that I have in the, in the basic law of large numbers. Yeah. So, but here's a slightly more interesting example. So more generally, think of this F as a function that depends only on a small part of some structure, right? So in the previous slide, that was just the first entry but basically I have some very large structure and the function just depends on a small part of it. It's like I put a window on that structure and the function only depends on stuff that's in the window. So, and now I observe a larger part of the structure as a sample. Okay. And um, I want to estimate this expectation. So, and now think of a n as the set of all transformations that I need if I want to take this window on which the function depends and I move it over the structure, part of the structure that I have observed using transformations, yeah? Let me explain this with this picture here. So if X is a random field on the grid, yeah? So on the grid at each point, I have one random variable that takes a real value. And I would like to estimate a function that is just the value again at the origin 
first coordinate function. Yeah. So here's my random grid. Here's my observation window. Yeah. So I read out this value here, and this is a random value. I want to estimate the expectation of this. So then I kind of the straightforward window estimator that would usually be used in, in statistics is you gather points from somewhere around that point, right? And average over those, so maybe over the neighbors, right? One way to do that is to apply a shift to that window and move it around. Yeah, an equivalent way is to keep the window in place and shift my structure around, right? So, and if I write it out that way, then I get exactly this average here, which in this case takes a form. I take all shifts within some radius and average over that. Okay. So now it turns out that for these, um, that ergodic theorists have a law of large numbers for averages like this. Yeah? It's the point wise ergodic theorem for amenable group actions. So I need two conditions. One is I need invariance again, right? And the invariant structures, like invariant structures, occur everywhere, at least in statistics probability, right? And I mean, so exchangeable random structures are generally, that's a kind of general name for um, random structures that are invariant, some form invariant under permutations, right? And one example are exchangeable sequences in Bayesian statistics. Um, another are exchangeable graphs that we talk about at this workshop, right? So graph on graphs are exchangeable. Um, exchangeable arrays, exchangeable partitions, random measures, you name it. Then there are stationary sequences. So stationarity generally refers to some form of shift invariance, right? Stationary sequences, stationary random fields, and so on. So, and the condition on the group that I need is amenability. So what that means is if I take, I have to be able to choose the sequence of compact sets that I'm using to compute my averages. I have to be able to choose that in such a form that if I take um, if I apply some transformation to one of these sets and see how far it has moved, that that asymptotically vanishes compared to the size of the set. Yeah? And I'm cutting a bit of a corner here. So this is the condition if the group is countable. If it's uncountable, you need to take a compact set here instead of a single element. But that's basically the idea. So if I can make these sets. So if I make the set larger and larger, then asymptotically, it must look as it does move. So, and this is a property that a group either has or it doesn't have. Either such a sequence exists or it doesn't exist. Yeah? And the permutation groups and the shift groups here, they have these prop this property and then many, many other groups. Yeah. So, now, and the, so yeah. That, so in general, amenable sort of means, so an amenable graph. So it's, um, for a graph, a minimal means there exists sort of a subsequence which has sort of boundaries going to yeah. zero, but not necessarily the balls. Yeah, that's right. um, it doesn't have to be balls. These sets so you say there necessary. must exist a sequence of yeah. sets. I, yeah, there must good. be a sequence of sets, but it doesn't have to be a nested sequence. Yeah, right. Okay. So, and then there's this result that exists in ergodic theory in like, unfortunately written up in a different language. So statistics has just not, has just lost track of what's going on there. And um, um, I think this is something that we in statistics should all know. Um, and this is, if these both, both of these conditions hold and I have a first movement, you know, then this sample average or this group average converges almost surely to the conditional expectation given, and I've written ergodic component in blue here because I haven't told you about that is yet. But so if you know what ergodic means in this context, I'm coming to that, but if you know what that means, if you, if you also assume ergodicity of X is ergodic, and this is just the expectation. So this is a, was in, for general amenable groups, this was proven by Elon Lindenstrauss um, in uh, 2001, but it's really the, the outcome like of, of successive generalizations of a long line of work by, by many people. So, and now to our result, um, I'm, a, I'm not a probabilist, I'm a computer scientist, but somebody has told me if I see a law of large numbers, I should ask for a central limit theorem. So, um, 
We need an additional condition to get a central limit theorem for this. We need an additional condition, which is a mixing condition. And um, so if you think about, of, if you have, I mean, if you know mixing in time series, basically what it says, if you have a discrete time stochastic process, there's different versions of, of mixing for that. But basically what they all say is you take, say, the first element of that process, first entry of that process, and then you take a tail from some element on, everything past some element. Now, if you make the gap between those two larger, they have to become, they must become approximately independent. Yeah? And the independence is measured by basically measuring total variation between a joint and a factorial. Yeah? So, and um, the form of mixing that we use here is um, if we look at this, the values in the sample average, right? It's always of the form function or fixed function applied to our random structure X and then some group element. So one way to look at this is to think of this here as, um, as a stochastic process indexed by the group, right? We get one random scalar value for each group element. So it's kind of like a random field on the group. So, and in this random field, we take two elements of this field at two locations, phi, phi one, phi two. And then we compare that to the values on some set, subset and on the group. So now we basically say, if that pair, if we move that pair far enough away from the set, then they must be approximately independent, again, conditional on something. So um, this year, this conditioning makes the condition actually considerably weaker in general. Yeah. So far you did but, have the distance of it. Yeah. So, if so you had to measure on the group, but not the distance. Yeah. So we need a distance on the group. The group has Haar measure, so it's locally compact, second countable in Hausdorff, so it has, it's metrizable, yeah? It is true that we have to choose a specific metric. The mixing is not just about metrizability, it needs a specific metric. But in these groups, typically there is a canonical metric, yeah? And also they're locally compact, so they're kind of morally finite dimensional. So usually you don't have a lot of latitude. Yeah. So, um, the reason why we have a pair here, not just a single entry, is basically because um, a central limit theorem is a second order result. So, a uh, question? Yeah. So, this so I can understand a little bit. So, suppose you have an infinite sequence of exchangeable random variables. So, what exactly does that condition imply? I'm assuming it's automatically satisfied, assuming finite second moments. Yeah, let me. Um, um, let, let me come to the, so exchangeability is a little tricky. Let me come to that, yeah? Like, if you can bear with me for a few slides, yeah, okay. Following up on that, I felt like uh, your previous examples are about exchangeability and now you move to joint exchangeability. Is my understanding correct? No, this is, so what I'm saying here is I, I apply to, again, Exchangeability, I have to say more about exchangeability, yeah? But um, this year it's just looking at two real numbers that I get for two different group elements. I transform by two different group elements. So, but, but this is the same action of the group. So I'm not, you know, I just take two different permutations and see what numbers I get, yeah? I'm not used to this notation, so forgive me. The, um... If phi one and phi two are nearby elements of the group, mm -hmm. then why would f of phi one x and f of phi two x be nearly independent? No, so oh, that's yeah. not what you said. So these two, <laughs> that's not what that means. I'm okay. looking at the joint distribution of these two. Yes. So I'm asking whether this pair becomes nearly independent of this, and this is far away. Ah, okay, good. Thank yeah. you. So now if that holds, then if we also have a second moment, then we can show that what we get is a central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem for the Linenstrauss theorem. So our sample average, um, the, the deviation of our sample average from its limit, yeah, that is asymptotically normal if we end the scaling is square root of the size of the set AM. Right, and if you think of the set AN as basically, in the previous example, as basically the number of things that I collect, 
the size of the data set that I collect, right, then this is really scaling as a cetera. So, and then the asymptotic variance looks like this. And um, the, the reason why I've written out the asymptotic variance is basically just to show that it's, it's not something complicated. It's really as, as simple as you can hope. But it is random, right? It is random, but- So it really is a conditional central limit theorem. It is, it is random, but if it is a function, so for in the ergodic case, it's constant. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to comment on that on the next slide. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's finite almost surely by Cauchy's. Yeah, course. and it is independent of the normal. Yeah, it's finite. Yeah, so to, to show that it's finite almost surely, you need the mixing. But it could be zero, right? It can be zero. It can be degenerate. Yeah. So. So, basically, um, for these. For the sample averages defined by groups, we get a law of large numbers. And if we have mixing, then we get a central limit zero. We also have Barry Essien bounds, which basically say, so which say, how far is this site? Um, so how, how much does this site here deviate from this site? So now, ergodicity. Yeah, so in my, my limit is conditional on something that I call the ergodic component. And this is um, based on something that's uh, called ergodic decomposition and functional analysis. Yeah. And this is basically a generalization of Aldous Hooper, if you will, of definite. So um, the, technical, the technical definition of ergodicity is that an invariant probability distribution, so the distribution of an invariant random structure, is ergodic if it is trivial on the group invariance Borel sets. So you take all Borel sets that are remain invariant under all group elements, and this measure has to have either put mass either zero or one on them. Yeah. So the problem with that is if you're not already used to it, then it's a little hard to see at first glance why that would be a good idea to look at a quantity like that. But if you look at it, so there's a geometric interpretation of this, which is um, the set of all invariant distributions for a given group on a given space is convex. That's like a one liner, you can just check it, right? And now if, again, if the group has Haar measure, the extreme points of that set are exactly the ergodic distributions, right? So basically you have a convex set of probability distributions that is also all your invariant distributions and the extreme points are special in some way. Yeah. So, and it has an integral representation that set. So every, dis every probability distribution in that set, every invariant one can be written as a mixture of extreme points. So for every P, there is some distribution on the extreme points such that you can write that as a mixture like this. So that means in particular, so or if you think of this as from a sampling perspective, what this says is you make a draw from this distribution here by selecting an extreme point at random and then drawing your random structure from that ergodic distribution. Yeah. So this is what this is just called good states and extreme states. Mm -hmm. Almost for the shift of yeah, for shift on the Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I would love to be able to answer that in, in general, but I can't. Right. Yeah. So um if this distribution is ergodic, then so this is clear that this is clear that the set of invariant measures is compact. Okay, so not in general. So how can I then have? Yeah. So if it's compact, yeah. If we have compactness here, and that is the case. So if the group is uh, acts continuously, and the space on which it acts is compact. So that is, for instance, for binary sequences, say, then it is actually, this is actually compact. This is actually compact. And then this is showcase theorem, right? Then the set is a showcase simplex. Uh, the set of extreme points is always a G delta. And uh, then by showcase theorem, you get a representation like this. The fascinating thing is that, so if you have compactness, if you have showcase theorem, then it doesn't matter what the points in that set are, whether they are probability measures or something, just have points in some vector space. Yeah. But it turns out that if these are specifically 
invariant probability measures, then even if we don't have compactness, the set this this behaves as if it was compact. Yeah. So in particular, there's because uh, so in particular there is a probability measure on this. In particular, this probability measure exists, yeah. and the set is measurable. The set of extreme points is measurable. So, so in the case where this distribution is where x is drawn from an ergodic distribution, this limit that I've written out on the previous slides, right? So, f of x given the ergodic component is exactly just the expectation. Yeah. In the case where it's not ergodic, this means this is the expectation under the ergodic measure from which we have actually generated X in this two-stage process. That means if we see an instance of say our infinitely large random graph, right? Then we have drawn that of an exchangeable graph. We have drawn that by drawing a graph on at random and then drawing for a graph from that graph on. This means our limits, our estimators recover properties of that graph on, of the graph on that has actually generated it. So and here are some examples of this. So if we have a sequence indexed by natural numbers, then the invariance is the invariance is exchangeability, so permutation invariance, right? Then the ergodic distributions are the IID distributions. That's the Kinetti's theorem, right? Then we know for graphs, exchangeable graphs, that those are the, the ergodic ones are the graph on distributions. So that's Aldous Huber. They didn't formulate it like that, and this ex this this is extra information, right? Because this doesn't give us the representation of this of the ergodic measures, right? Aldous Huber X adds extra information by saying as the ergodic the ergodic measures can be represented in this particular way by a function, and um, I mean this holds also for instance for stationarity, but for stationarity in general we don't get a limit object like that, and I mean I can't prove anything about that, but kind of just as an observation, it seems that exchangeability is special in the sense that the existence of limit objects is a hallmark of exchangeability. Yeah. So for instance, in population genetics, there's something called an exchangeable partition that is, plays a similarly important role in population genetics as, as graphon models do in networks. And there you also have a limit object that was, um, um, that was identified by Kingman in the 60s. That's called a box distribution. So if you have exchangeability, that is somehow strong enough. That's a very strong constraint because the group grows quickly, right? That that is somehow strong enough to give you limit objects, but for other groups, you don't necessarily get them. It's just, a, I mean, again, it's just an observation. Okay. So um, let me get to exchangeability. So um, here's an example that we know. X is an infinite graph. Sorry. Sorry. So sorry. Uh, for the previous slide, again, I don't know like if I'm missing something, but my memory is that when the sequence is exchangeable, then the adrotic measures are the Aldo Schreiner P model. And when the sequence is indexed by sorry. two. So we're, we're talking about sequences, and the then the ergodic measures also have to be distributed on sequences. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be an Adoshreni, right? The Adoshreni, okay. the Adoshreni graph is a ergodic exchangeable mm -hmm. graph, but it's I, just the subclass of the ergodic ones. I remember like um, the sequence will need to be indexed by two uh, indices and then jointly exchangeable, then we get symmetry. So what version. you could do is you could take an exchangeable sequence mm -hmm. and write that into a random graph, right? Just right. reorder it into a graph. And then indeed, because the, the corresponding ergodic sequences would be IID, you would get an Erdos Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, so for subgraph counts, um, if we have an infinite graph that's drawn from a graph on, right? Then we choose the set AN over which we average as the permutations or the first N numbers. And, um, then we'd make f the indicator function of some subgraph, say a triangle. So that the um, let's make this one, two, three. Here. Yeah. So and then we can, um, if we plug that into Lindenstrauss, then we get that this um, this average here is just the average subgraph count, right? And we know then so Lindenstrauss then tells us that we get convergence to the expectation. Yes, but the group that I'm, so here AN is 
there's the set finite set that I'm averaging over. And the infinite group is the union of that over all n. So all finitely, uh, finitely supported permutations of the natural numbers. So, and basically, where the martingale argument shows up in graph limit theory, you can replace it by this. You can replace it by the initial. And the connection to martingales is that if you take the set of all, so if you take the set of all Borel sets that are invariant under the subset here, there's a sigma algebra. And this average is measurable in that sigma algebra. So, and then if you make these sets larger and larger, the sigma algebra becomes smaller and smaller. And that is a reverse filtration. And then you can show that if these guys are in particular groups in their own right, then that actually, this, the sequence of these averages actually becomes a reverse. So wait, in, so there are two places where the reverse Martingale shows up. If you want to show that a sequence of graphs where the subgraph counts uh, that you have a convergent oh, subsequence. I know, sorry. I know what you're getting at. So let me say, if you want to do Kallenberg, you can plug this in. Let us take the other discussion offline between the two of us, but let's have it. Yeah. Okay. So, and we already know, so this is just if I apply Linden Strauss here, I get, this is an alternative way to get the convergence here. And we of course already know from various previous results that there is a central limit theorem here. This is asymptotically normal. If I look at your previous theorem, there your your centering or your your multiplication was by the square root of yeah, the size of a, exactly. which is humongous exactly. here. Exactly. So uh, there has to be some. That's sort why of I saw. That's why I said we have or... to talk about exchangeability separately. Ah. Okay. So it turns out that if you have if you take if you have exchangeability and you use these here as your the the groups of uh, the the finite symmetric groups as your sets that you average okay. over then that doesn't fit into the mixing condition. And you have to work a little extra. But I can give you a result for that. And that is with, with some extra work, you can show that if you have any exchangeable random structure, and if you have some random structure, the group of finitely supported permutations of the natural numbers acts on that structure, on, on that space. So, and you have um, a second moment and you have a condition here that basically says that the function you're looking at is not too sensitive to pairwise swaps, to any pairwise swap. Yeah? Then you get asymptotic normality, um, just as in the previous case, but the scaling is now a square root of n. This has the one over n factorial, which is the size of the group. Exactly. Yeah. In, a, in a slightly different place. Yeah, exactly. So this this year is this year is just a normalization. This is so this is just the normalization for the sample average, number of terms in this average, right? But then the scaling for the central limit theorem is this. Yeah. And then here I've actually written out the very acid bound. So the Wasserstein distance between this side here, and that is why I've written the eta here on this side, right? So that we're always comparing to a standard normal. The Wasserstein distance between this term and a standard normal, Wasserstein one distance, is of this order. What if eta is zero? Sorry? Yeah. Eta yeah. could be zero. That's right. It can be degenerate. But can then degenerate. this can't be really true. Sorry. Then square root of n over eta yeah, is yeah, not sure, defined. Sure. Sorry. So if it's degenerate, then I have to then I have to write the eta over there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So and um, um, so one thing that I just want to briefly mention here, if you can see here if you so. If you, if you think about the, making this again, making this a subgraph count for some graphon model, then we know if, if it's an Erdos Rheni, I mean, we know it can be degenerate, right? But we know in general, if it's an Erdos Rheni, then we're overscaling here, right? We can do scale by one over n. And um, one way to connect that to the symmetry is to notice that the Erdos Rheni just has more permutation symmetries than a general exchangeable graph, right? And in Erdos Rheni, because the entries are IID, I can take any permutations of arbitrary entries. I cannot just permute rows and columns. I can take any permutation of the upper triagonal of the adjacency matrix. And the number of permutations that are permitted there or the number of elements that I can permute is in quadratic compared to the basic graph on case. And that's where the scale comes from. Yeah. This might be a vague question. I just have um, 
hard time understanding what it means to take the conditional expectation given the ergodic component. Mm -hmm. So can you just maybe give yeah. a few words on more intuition on that? Does it have anything to do with like when you can quotient out some group and then kind of restrict to the or is uh, that not the right way to think about no, it? No, I wouldn't put it that way. So let so if you think about it in the case of exchangeable graphs again, right? Then we know that the way that that exchangeable any exchangeable graph is generated is by drawing a graph one at random and then drawing from that graph one, right? And what that means here is that if we if we generate a graph that way, right? I generate the graph that way. I hand it to you. You compute these averages. The convergence you get is to the expectation under that graph one. So under kind of the true graph one that has actually generated the graph, even though it's unknown. Since you're a statistician, you can think of that as kind of a base frequentist thing. So the frequentist, the model, your statistical model, your set of distributions that you posit as a model is always a set of ergodic measures. Okay. If you're a frequentist, then you assume that the true distribution is fixed but unknown. And otherwise, you put a prior on it and mix, and then you get the interior of this convex set. Yeah. And you cannot, from a single, even infinitely large graph, you cannot recover information about the prior. Yeah. Okay, so um, we have some generalizations of this that I just want to mention briefly. Um, one is a kind of triangular array version of this, if you will. So that is where we allow the random structure and the function to change with n as we make this happen. That is, I mean, you have to put bounds on how quickly it changes. But basically, if you get, if you, you can formulate that in terms of this being uniformly integrable, and then you also need the mixing to hold uniformly in some sense over n. And then these results basically still work. They become a little more technical to write out, but they basically still work. There's something like a generalized u statistic here is not the same generalized u statistic as Adrian mentioned earlier. It's basically one way to write a u statistic is by taking a function of several arguments and then permuting something. And then there is an asymptotically equivalent way where you where you shift each entry, right? What we're doing here is basically instead of shifts, applying shifts to each entry, we apply a group element to each entry. It turns out that you get a version of U statistic there that's still asymptotically normal. And um, so, and then finally, what we can do, we can so we've taken these averages over sets of transformations. We can subsample that set of transformations, and that is um, so. Um, we draw some subsample of the set a n here that doesn't have to be uniform, it just has to be independent of x. And um, it has to satisfy some, I mean, basically, it must not concentrate on two smaller parts of the set. But then you can average over the subsample instead, and you still get a result. Yeah? So you, get you can take any of these in combination with each other. So let me um, <clears throat> give you like. Just a few examples of what we can do with it. One is we can look at random fields. So we have some random field that is um, assigns to each an, a random real value to each group element. And then we can, so that is indexed by the group itself, say by RD. That's an amenable group. And then we can let the group act on itself by shifts, and that gives us stationarity. Yeah. But it could also be, I mean, it could be any group, but I mean, RD is a simple example. So, and then, um, if we have conditional mixing, we get um, a central limit theorem for that. In the case where the group is specifically Z, ZD, um, this is Bolthausen central limit theorem for random fields. Then um, we can, using this generalization that I just mentioned, this triangular array version of it, we can look at stochastic block models where the number of classes grows. So the change in the distribution is that the number of model parameters goes up, basically. Yeah. And, um, 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 and then there is, um, so we can also, we can also get asymptotic normality for estimation in the current Fox model, uh, the GraphX model in the terminology of this workshop. Um, that is a little different because the invariance in this model is not actually simply permutation invariance. The group is, is a lot larger and it's not amenable. And this group, which just take chunks of the real line and swaps them that becomes more complicated but basically the way to do that is um, you can you can look at the graphics and then at least this estimator that 
uh, that Victor and Dan developed and then um, turn that into a surrogate object that is an exchangeable array. And how much time do I have? Do I have time? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So then let me just briefly mention this. This is a little tangential to everything I've discussed here, but I, I just really like it. Um, so um, in, in information theory, when you want to discuss, if you want to um, define the entropy of, of a finite alphabet discrete time process, the way you do it is you take the first n entries of the process, the joint distribution of that, look at the Shannon entropy of that, right? That's a distribution on a finite set, Shannon entropy of that, and then you take the limit of that, right? And then the Shannon Macmillan Bryman theorem tells you if your process is stationary, then that converges. And if it's ergodic, then it's a constant. And you use that as that, con that limiting constant as it's your definition of entropy. And um, you can basically use this idea that the picture I showed you earlier, we were shifting something around, right? This idea of collecting something by shifting something around using the group. You can use that to generalize this notion of taking the first n entries and define a generalization of um, um, of entropy for a larger class of processes. It's something that ergodic theorists have done. And then Linden Strauss has shown that there is a generalization of the Shannon Macmillan Bryman theorem to that basically if the group is countable and these sets here have to kind of, they must grow quickly enough basically. And for that, we can also get asymptotic normality. Okay, so to summarize, um, I have this little table here where I basically look at higher, like increasing order results, if you will, right? So ergodic decomposition or Aldous Hoover, Diffinetti, that is kind of a zero order result, it's a representation theorem. In order to get that, we need the group just, we need a harm measure on the group. Basically. Um, so the condition on the distribution is that it's invariant. Then for the law of large numbers, we need amenability of the group and we need a first moment. Um, for the center limit theorem, we need amenability, a metric, as Christian pointed out, and then the second moment and mixer. And for the Barry Essien bound, <clears throat> I've written I've written geometry here in gray. Of course, it, so the geometry is given by the metric, but in the Barry Essien bound, the, the volume of balls and how they intersect with these sets that we're averaging over it appears explicitly in the bound in the central limit theorem. It does. So in a sense, the geometry plays a more explicit role. And then we need a fourth moment. So then um, I have a couple of observations here. So one is that we've worked out a number of examples. And the one thing is worth mentioning, I think, is that the asymptotic variances always, are always really, really clicky. So usually, if you prove center limit theorems with dependence, you can get really nasty asymptotic variances. But when you have this is something like if you have a if the symmetry is present, it seems they just come out very clean. Yeah. So um, then we don't need a stable convergence condition. So if you if you have something like if you prove center limit theorems for dependent structures, something like a Galton Watson tree or something, then you have to make sure that your asymptotic variance doesn't couple with um, with your limit variable. And the reason why we don't need that here is basically because conditionally on the ergodic component is constant. Yeah. So the ergodic decomposition saves us from that. Um, and then I just want to mention that there is, so in a sense, what I'm telling you here is that, I mean, it's, it's an example of universality flowing from symmetry. And there's, um, we have another example of that. Morgan has another example of that. So Morgan has a follow-up paper on this where she looks at free probability. And then basically, for those of you who know, happen to know what free probability is, right? So she takes free independence, generalizes that to something like free invariance. And then you get, again, get a central limit theorem and you can apply that to random matrices. Yeah. So the universality that you get there is a, is a version of the Wigner law. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Cutting into lunch, but maybe I lost still a few questions. Those who want to leave for lunch, we just can leave. <laughs> yeah, so what is the what are the tools? 
So what are the tools that go into proving the CLT? Yeah. So the, the, uh, it's basically an adaptation of Stein's method. Um, and the adaptation that you need, I mean, there's a number of adaptations, but the main adaptation that you need is like, um, you know how Stein's method works for locally dependent variables with a dependency neighborhood, right? And here, basically what we have is we take, so you look again at, at a single group element, you look at some ball around that, right? That would be your dependency neighborhood, but it turns out that we can't get a sharp cutoff. So we have short range correlations within that ball and long range correlations outside it. And basically you treat everything inside that ball as if it was a dependency neighborhood, more or less. And then you control what's outside with mixing. I mean, I was, I was about to ask the same question, but a follow-up question. If you do that truncation, usually by very seam bound, you mean you have rates of convergence or do you mean specifically you have a metric that you're using? Yeah. Because you yeah. mentioned Wasserstein metric just It's a Wasserstein metric, not total variation. Okay. Yeah. So we can so bound- So by seen, you mean a rate? By very seen, I mean, we can bound the, the Wasserstein metric between the error and the standard normal. Okay. Yeah. But you mentioned using this truncation idea, right? Usually, that when you do that, you get additional log terms. But I haven't, I didn't see any log terms in your Wasserstein I can, bound. Yeah. I'm, um, if you're still around for a bit, I'm happy to show you the the Wasserstein bound for the case with mixing, mm -hmm. where that actually, because this was the only Wasserstein bound I've shown you, was a case for exchangeability, which is a little okay twisted. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I have a question also sort of on this Wasser. So if you were not in, so once you want to formulate a distance, you, I can see where you would need a distance on your space because otherwise your Wasserstein distance is not even defined. But it seems that if you just want to send a limit theorem, requiring a distance seems- So the, the space we're talking about is just the real line, right? Because we have already mapped our function already has already mapped into the real line. We're taking a sample average. And we're just comparing to a standard normal, the error to a standard normal. That is where the Wasserstein distance happens. Oh, I see. So it's just a real line. But why do you, I mean, you said you need a distance there. So that's, to some extent, it's counterintuitive. Why this, would I need a metric for a central limit here? This, yeah, so the metric this one, enters, yes. this is the metric on the group. And so the why do I enters, need that? The way it enters is with a mixing condition. To formulate the mixing condition to say that set that substitutes for the tail is far away from that pair of elements. That's how why we need the metric. More questions? Okay, let's thank Peter again. Thank